Well, good morning and welcome to everyone to this meeting of um, the Audit, Governance and Ethics Committee. Um, thank you all for making it through the, uh, the, the traffic this morning. I believe there was a, a bit of an accident and a bit of a snarl up on the motorway, which is why we're starting the meeting um, a bit late. Um, we'll start off with apologies for absence. We have uh, James Mason, our independent person, and Councillor Brown, Councillor Ernie Brown. And moving straight on to emergency evacuation procedures, I'll pass over to Angie. Uh, we do not have any further fire alarm tests uh, due today. We had one just prior to this meeting. Uh, if so, if the alarm does go off, then your exit route is through those doors there, and then follow me to the evacuation point. Thank you, Angie. Uh, we're moving on to agenda item three, which is declaration. <coughs> sorry, excuse me. Declaration of interests. Um, I don't have any. Does anybody else have any declarations of interest before today's meeting? No. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, agenda item four is public access, but we haven't received any public access statements before this meeting. So we'll move on to uh, agenda item. Ask a question. I mean, this is quite a remote spot, isn't it, for members of the public to get to? Has there been any question of... Uh, people not being able to get here or you know should we take that in mind when we're fixing further meetings um, council I, I can take that question yes. if you want um, as you know it's quite a challenge to find meetings that can take the numbers of people and and that's because got easier as COVID has become less prevalent. Um, we do try and have as many as we can um, in the headquarters and at this location. The headquarters, there is a lack of room availability and quite often the police have booked rooms, so we end up here instead. I appreciate it is a bit distant for some people. Uh, we also try to move meetings around the unitary authority areas. So if you would like to suggest another location for a committee meeting, please do. Emma spends a lot of time trying to pre-book venues so the sooner we can get the bookings in the better but this is a bit of a legacy because we're coming towards the end of the municipal year and all these rooms were booked some time ago but yes I'll take that on board for for going forward thank you thank you both okay moving on to um, agenda item five chairs business um, so uh, w welcome everyone to the meeting um, I'm just confirming that this committee meeting is taking place as a face-to-face -face meeting but we are also recording the meeting for the public to view on the fire authority youtube channel so i will we'll ask for introductions from the members um, first off i am councillor goggin from um, bristol city council and i'll just pass over to um, the councillors to my left uh, councillor david wilcox representing lockley's ward in bristol Councillor Neil Butters, Bath, Bath Avon South, Bath North East Somerset. Uh, Richard Tucker, North Somerset Council, Western Supermare in Milton. Uh, Robert Payne, Councillor for Western Supermare Central, North Somerset Council. Uh, John Ash, Councillor for Bradley Stoke South, South Gloucestershire Council. And I'll just ask um, officers and others to introduce themselves. Again, I'll start on my left. Hi, I'm Angie Feeney, Director of Corporate Services here at Avon Fire and Rescue Service. Good morning, Amanda Brown. I'm the clerk to Avon Fire Authority. Morning, Vicky Gould, Internal Audit Manager, RSM, the Fire Services Internal Auditors. Good morning, Caroline Taylor, Head of Corporate Assurance, Continuous Improvement and Planning at Avon Fire and Rescue Service. Misha Hopton, External Audit, Deloitte. Kevin Woodward, Interim Treasurer for Avon Fire Authority. Thank you all. And um, I'd just like to remind you, although you've all done it um, already, is to use your microphones when speaking so that it can be picked up um, for the recording and just to turn them off when you've finished using. Um, any voting required today will take place by asking members for a show of hands. Um, first off, I'll ask for any votes against. Then I'll ask for any abstentions, um, and obviously everybody else is voting for. 
Okay, that's the chair's business dealt with. So I'll move on uh, now to the minutes from the last meeting held on the 22nd of September. Um, we have all received uh, copies of the minutes, so I'm going to move that they are a um, accurate record. But does anybody have any issues with them? Can I have a seconder, please? Robert, thank you. Okay, uh, moving swiftly on again um, to agenda item seven, the external audit update, and uh, I'd like to welcome. Sorry, can I just check everybody approves the minutes? I didn't see the votes for. Yeah, everybody. Yes, thank you, thank you. Sorry, I missed that. That's probably my. Apologies, uh, Amanda. I'm jumping the gun a bit there, getting excited. Um, as I said, uh, moving on to external audit update um, uh, and introducing Michelle Hopton from Deloitte. So just an update in relation to the external audit. So the external audit has progressed. Um, we are probably around 70 to 80% complete. Um, we have notified and had discussion with Kevin around signing these accounts. Unfortunately, we won't be in a position to sign them by the 30th of November. And I know there's a statement that needs to be published, which, which Kevin's prepared and we've, we've reviewed. I suppose the key reasons around where we are, so pensions, there's two significant areas of testing to complete, mainly tent pensions and um, valuation. So for pensions, we are relying on the pension authority auditors to respond to our letter and as yet we haven't had a response as with the other thing is valuation testing which we need to do need to conclude with our specialists i suppose in terms of just giving a bit of background into the local government and the um, picture of external audit i don't know if you're aware but there is significant issues in terms of external audit um, mainly around signing 2021 audits there's around 40% of 2021 audits which aren't yet signed, which is a significant backlog. Um, and we have obviously worked with PSAA and committed to completing the FY21 audits. So, but we, we have prioritised your audit. So your 2022 audit has started. Some audits haven't started yet, but yours has started. It's just unfortunately not going to quite complete before the 30th of November. But like I say, progress has been made. We are probably around 70 80% complete. Um, we're looking around a timetable to complete that. Um, there ha so we're looking to complete that probably around February, March time, because where we are in November now with Christmas and with December year end, which have um, listed debt and you know, regulatory reporting requirements, we will be picking the audit up back in February. The other thing to mention is continuity is really important. So the individual who was working on even fire another a reason why it hasn't got finished they've been sick they went off sick and are coming back in january and my preference in terms of getting efficient and effective audit would be for them to pick up and finish that piece of work so we're looking at them coming back on board in february and i know that's probably later than you'd hoped and we will work with the fire authority to clear as much as possible but as uh, my perspective positive is your audit has started and we have got a timetable to get it completed happy to take any questions Thank you, uh, Michelle. So um, when you say about the, the local government sector and auditors, this is a national issue, is it? Yeah, so that, that number is a national picture. So 40% nationally of 2021 audits haven't signed. So, you know, you're actually in the, the better half. Your 2021 audits have signed and your 2022 has commenced. Um, so, yeah, it is a, it's a local picture. I'm oh, sorry, a national picture, not specific to Deloitte. Okay, I'm going to open up to questions now from members and officers. Robert? Um, yeah, I, I note that um, it is a statutory requirement to publish it by the 30th of November. Um, since that's not going to be achieved, what are the consequences for the authority for not, for not achieving that? So th there are no consequences, which is probably in a, in a sense potentially why kind of we are where we are, because of the 21 audits which aren't signed that there, there hasn't been a consequence for them so it it's been quite an uphill challenge to get those audits signed and but yeah there is there is no consequence on that any other questions from members i think in answer to councillor's paying question it might be worth stating that the regulations do state that you have to provide an explanation as to why so the regulations set that out it's actually set out in the paper and also um, that you must then 
complete the audit as soon as practicable, I think that's the wording. I'm, I'm trying to remember where it is in the paper. But it is covered. That It's not just a case of you can let the deadline pass. You have to publish a statement and commit to complete that audit as soon as practicable. Thank you, Amanda. David? Okay. Um, I'm going to ask now our interim treasurer to contribute. Okay. Thank you, Paul. <clears throat> so I have a short paper um, starting on page 11 of our pack, but um, before I go into the report, just to respond to the update that Michelle has just given. I think um, some of you, or most of you around this table, I was here three years ago, and we would have been doing this same exercise. In fact, I've done many of these, getting the accounts through, and I know this can be a hard slog to get it to the authority on time within statutory deadlines. So when I came here and I realised that this hadn't been completed, it was, it was, I didn't feel comfortable with it because I've never experienced a, a time when we couldn't get the accounts um, to the committee on time. But I'm quickly getting up to speed and obviously I realise with the impact of the global pandemic and the backlog that that has caused and further complexities within local government, I realise that we are not the only ones, as Michelle has explained. A number of authorities haven't got their accounts signed off, audited within the statutory deadline. So I wouldn't say I'm comfortable with it, and it's not the place any of us would want to be. Um, but here we are. So this paper deals with the legal requirements from that position. So in this short paper, um, as Amanda has explained, um, we have to publish on our website a public notice to say that we've not met the statutory deadline. And as a result of that, we have to put that notice on our website to explain the reasons why. So there is a notice drafted for approval here this morning, which is on page 15. So that's the main part of this paper. Um, the other issue for me, as Michel has explained, um, ideally um, we would like the audit completed as quickly as possible um, for two reasons. Um, firstly, from an authority point of view, um, we are now very much at the start of our financial planning cycle. So to be dealing with the audit during that time is, is a distraction to the team. So we would want to work with Michelle to make sure that any distraction is minimised. But also, at this point in time, I would normally be seeing a report from the auditors because I'd, I'd be interested in what of the content of that report and if there are any issues of any, any I think, what we would call errors and misstatements within the accounts because that's something that I would, would want to know fairly quickly so that if there are any serious issues within that, within that report, then I would look to address them as soon as possible. And obviously... We will be producing the accounts for 22-23 from April of next year, so I'd want to know the content of that as soon as possible. So I would plead to Michelle that if we could have that um, report finalised as soon as is practically possible. Um, I think I'll stop there, Chair, and um, ask for any questions. Thank you, Kevin. Michelle, did you want to respond at all to that? I'd probably only just say, yeah, I'm happy to have a, you know, a discussion around any misstatements that we've identified. I'm not aware of any significant ones that I think Claire and Ross should be audit ready. So not nothing comes to mind that you know we haven't already on the list. But yeah, maybe we have that transparency call with you and just make sure you're up to speed of what we have identified and we can get that in fairly swiftly. Thank you. Um, Neil. Thank you, Chair. Yes, yeah, so it's a little bit worrying. I'm just thinking about uh, the years ahead. Uh, are we going to be faced with this on a regular basis, or is the situation getting better or worse, would you say? So I suppose in terms of the situation, I think it's been very static. I think a lot of pressure has been put on to get the 41% signed by the end of November. I think if I reflect on that, the progress that we would expect to have made hasn't been made. Um, but I think as an audit firm, we are working very closely with every authority or you know look on that backlog to get them done as quickly as possible because actually it's putting financial pressure on us it's putting resource pressure on us that we need to alleviate and we've done actually significant recruitment specifically to be able to to deal with that backlog um so there is there is actually national focus on, on getting it done in terms of fy23 we would look to have your audit back on track to start it as we always do in, in july um so you know, hopefully there's a blip this year, but then whoever, you know, if Kevin's around, whoever his replacement is, to work really closely in relation to that 2023 audit to get a you know, clear commitment on deadlines and you know, work together to have a clear project management around that audit. 
Thank you, Neil. Are you okay with that? And um, uh, Michelle, how much has do you think the the pandemic has uh, you know contributed as a, as a hopefully a one off event? Significantly, I, it, I, I keep saying you know it, it, you know we must be even there, but actually this, it has had a critical impact. One, it's had impact on a backlog because of audits have been done remotely for a number of years and they just seem to be taking longer they've taken longer and but for me i want my audits to be back out on site because i think they're more efficient you know you get the personal touch and working together so we have been on site a number of times for avon this this time round. um and the other thing um is around you know getting people out of their comfort zone since pandemic so actually people have got quite comfortable at home so that's that's a cultural thing we need to change um, and in terms of you know that face-to-face -face coaching you know we need to be face-to-face -face coaching our team so we need, for me critically is getting people back outside working together on an audit but it has had a significant impact thank you michelle do we have any other questions from members no Okay, well, the recommendations um, for item seven, uh, we are asked to note the delay with the external audit process and explanation provided by uh, external auditors Deloitte. And we are also asked to approve the publication on the Fire Authority website of the draft statutory notice included as an appendix to this report, stating that Avon Fire Authority will not be able to publish a statement of, of accounts for 21-22 as the audit has not been concluded. And we've all got a copy of that in the pack. So I would like to um, move that we um, do both of those recommendations. Do I have a seconder? Oh, sudden rush. I'll, I'll take David as, as your closest. Um, can I ask for um, any votes against? Any abstentions and votes for? That's carried unanimously. So... Thank you very much, Michelle. OK, um, we're moving on now to agenda item eight, which is the annual statement of assurance. And um, Caroline, I think you're presenting this one. Correct. Thank you, Chair, and morning, members. So if I can ask members to turn to page 21 of their pack, I'll see the annual statement of assurance as Appendix 1. So members, this is a paper coming to you for a decision, and that decision is for approval and then publication of the draft <coughs> annual statement of assurance, and the chair of the fire authority needs to sign the statement as well, and that needs approval. So the statement of assurance is a requirement for fire and rescue authorities in accordance with the 2018 National Framework document for fire and rescue services. The National Framework document sets out the government priorities and objectives for fire and rescue services and the annual statement of assurance document in front of you provides assurance to the public and government on Avon and Fire and Rescue govern Rescue's governance, financial and operational areas. This is an annual document that has to be produced and published by the 31st of March in respect to the previous financial year and therefore the draft statement of assurance for the year 2021-22 is provided for your consideration and approval. The document reviews our areas of governance, finance and operational and looks to provide assurance that we're meeting the expectations set out in the national framework. To gain this assurance, managers across the service have provided updates on how we can evidence we're fulfilling the requirements of the national framework and the service leadership team, service leadership board and monitoring office, officers have also reviewed and considered this report. So that's my update. Any questions, please? Thank you very much. I'll ask for questions from members. Uh, David? Uh, thank you, and uh, thank you, Caroline, for your report. Um, I'm just wondering if we need to note on page five that the, uh, the audited accounts are actually delayed in some way. I think there was a reference and update provided to that in the um, report. Pardon? Page 25. 
sorry. I think it would be helpful to add that in any event, so we can note that if it doesn't already appear on page five, that we can add a note to that effect. Okay. Yes, it's just it's just referenced on the bottom of page eight that um, it will be published as soon as the audit's concluded. So there is reference to the fact the audit needs concluding. So it's a big document to find the reference. Yeah, and I think the, the wording was changed on page, page five to say once approved, whereas previously it says that they have been approved, but we can expand on that and link across to the public kind of document that we're also um, establishing as well. So thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you both. Um, okay, then, uh, Neil. Thank you, Chair. Just looking at the table on page 11, stroke 31, um, I wonder if officers have any comments to make. There seems to be quite a big difference between 21 and 22 in terms of the total posts. Uh, and also, I was just wondering about um, what does the working time legislation have to say, in fact, about uh, breaks between shifts? Uh, is that an issue, or do, does that work pretty well? Do we get complaints? Sorry, can I just clarify? So, Councillor, page 31, page 11 of the report, I think you're referring mm -hmm. to, yes? Can you, would you mind just repeating slowly your question? Sorry. So is this the table which sets Sorry, this out... is the table on page 11, stroke yeah. 31 in the overall... Other paragraph underneath. Yes. And uh, the blue and the pink, they're, they're quite significant differences between the two Septembers. I just wondered if the, any officers would, you know, wish to comment on that. To... <laughs> yes, in terms of the operational numbers yes. reducing... Um, yes, yeah, so I think if, if you look at the overall numbers and what's said under use of retained duty systems, the number of have, have posts have reduced from by, by five. What's happened is that the, the distribution of those between second, what we call secondary contracts and, and on-call has changed. So mm. because we do struggle to recruit in some areas on on-call, yes. what we do for that resilience is some of our whole time staff then take secondary contracts as on-call. Yes, yeah, sure, so yes. That's so the, that's, that's the position in terms of you know, what, the fluctuations in terms of the, the rows that you're talking around. The totals changes is, is, is five. Yes, and, and, in terms uh, of the and working... well, you're quite happy about that. That's not causing problems, is it? No, it's it's not causing us problems. Okay. And, and PRSE, of course, um, always look at our, our data in terms of our right. kind of response. Thank you. And in terms of your second one, which was around working time directive, yes, um, we do follow that with reference to our whole time crews and the breaks that they have between shifts and also our on call. And we monitor that through a system we've got called Repel. So we are very alive to the issues ar around that. Can you actually say what the minimum amount is? In terms of a break, in I don't want to have to break. look at digging back to my HR days, which were a little bit kind of rusty. I might need to get back to you on that, Councillor Butters. I think it is kind of 12, but there are compensatory rest breaks as well. So I think to give you a very detailed answer, I'd probably need to come back to you well, on that. Well, I, I don't need a very detailed answer, but I'd be interested in some sort of answer. <laughs> Thank I'll, you. I'll, I will give you. Thank you. Fine. It's, it's good to know that they're being complied with anyway, whatever the actual figure. Yes. I've just been advised it's nine hours, the break, the minimum break. Between any? Any shifts. Are there any other questions on the document? Okay. Well, the committee is asked to approve the annual statement of assurance 21-22 uh, for publication and to recommend that the chair of the overall authority signs the foreword on... Oh, sorry, that, that would be me, won't it? Recommend that the chair sign the foreword, or is it Brenda? Yes. Okay. Can I suggest a slight amendment to recommendation A? So can we have approved the annual statement of assurance 2021 for publication subject to the addition of a note on page 5 regarding the delayed accounts? Just to, to bring up Councillor Wilcox's point. 
Thank you, Amanda. So uh, the committee is asked to approve the annual statement of assurance for publication subject to the change on page five uh, and to recommend that the chair of the fire authority signs the foreword on behalf of the full fire authority. So um, I'd like to move that we do both of those. Um, do I have a seconder? Richard, thank you. Um, do I have any votes against that? Do I have any abstentions? And all those in favour, please. Again, that's carried unanimously, so thank you very much all. We'll now move on to agenda item nine, which is the internal audit updates and reports, and Vicky Gold from RSM will be presenting that. Thank you, Vicky. Thank you, Chair. Okay, I'll take you through our first paper, which is our progress report. So this sets out progress with delivery of the 22-23 internal audit plan. Um, we, to the, we brought to the last meeting the protection audit and to this meeting we're bringing the business case and benefits realisation audit which is in line with our original timetable. The rest of the plan is in progress. The key financial controls review um, took place a few weeks ago and the draft report is almost ready to be, um, to be issued so that will come to the next meeting and the audits taking place in January are in the scoping phase, so they are all planned to take place and deliver the audit plan to the agreed timetable. Um, with the there's some timing changes or some pushback on the corp uh, corporate reporting and pensions work, but we already reported that to the last meeting, so that's nothing new. And then we've issued some recent sector briefings, um, which you can ask for. We haven't included them in the papers because they're quite a large document. So um, they have some uh, fire sector briefing um, documents if you'd, um, if you'd like to read them um, as part of your bedtime reading. But um, yeah, any questions on the progress report? If not, I will go on to our audit report. Do members have any questions on that part? <coughs> Excuse me. No, I think you can carry on, Vicky. Thank you. OK, so this audit was an advisory audit. So. Um, this was around, so last, last year, you'll recall, we did an audit on the transformation programme, so looking at the project management arrangements and, and that, that everything was in place to enable the, the transformation programme to be delivered, um, feeding in good project management practice. This is the, the a next step on and looking at change management, um, business cases and benefits realisation outside of the transformation programme, so just to make it clear that this is this audit was um, taking place outside of the transformation programme. And given that the PMO currently is fully focused on the transformation programme, it's looking at what is in place and management were already aware that there were gaps and therefore this is why this is an advisory review because it was looking to feed in benchmarking from what we see across the rest of our client base and feed in good practice so that actions could be developed to take this forward. Most of the actions um, that have been agreed are more of an interim measure because um, of, you have to balance the kind of resource um, and the capacity given that PMO are focusing on the transformation programme. And so um, a lot of these um, issues in, in the long term future will be addressed when the PMO is organisation wide. But in the meantime, management were keen to put some interim measures in place to make sure that where there are change programmes or projects that sit outside of transformation, that, that, that there's a robust um, framework around that for um, planning, for approval and then for delivery and delivering um, things to budget, delivering things to um, the obje objectives and really um, realising those benefits um, that have been, put, that have been um, predicted. So there's a number of actions agreed um, around the corporate project register being updated and being made a live document around having a Microsoft Teams site where staff can access information around what project management support there is out there around the, the project register and business case templates so that everybody is aware of um, the standard processes that should be applied. Um, the, the, the transformation programme has a work stream in it at the moment which is looking at this area but it hadn't made much progress when we did the audit but they had already done a survey of, of, of senior management um, to ask their views on on change management and how they apply that to try and feed that into to the kind of um, improvement moving forward 
So there's some actions there around responding to the, to these surveys to make sure that everyone's aware of, of the processes that, that, are, that are expected of them. And then there's just a few actions around the, the actual business case template, improving that to support staff and filling it out in more detail so that they're really thinking about the costs and the timelines that are going into these projects. And then making sure that, uh, that any business cases are being monitored through central logs and, and through the SLT um, agendas. So I'll take any questions on, on the detail in the report. Thank you, Vicky. Questions? Richard? Just under um, 5.2, the, the final bullet point, in terms of the uh, consistency of terminology and understanding, uh, the, the staff have requested that in terms of feedback from the interviews or uh, discussions. I just wondered uh, what progress has been made with that at all or how... how Sort of awkward an issue that is for people. So is this control five? Yes. On page fourteen. Yeah. Business cases and benefits realisation. Yeah, I think this yeah, is part 14. of the edu educational piece where where we've talked about um, having that um, Microsoft Teams workspace where people can access. Um, documentation and, and get access to the project managers across the organisation and also there's an action around um, responding to the survey results and making sure that there's um, a kind of consistent message communicated across across the teams. I don't know if um, anyone else wants to come in from the fire side. I think the question was more about whether progress has been made yet with the terminology that's used and understanding what might constitute a project or programme. Is that where that's you were? Kind of where I was. So I don't know whether Quite there's frank, any up to, I, I think because this is a very recent yeah. report, I suspect, I mean, I, I'm not the ex subject matter expert here, but I suspect the training hasn't happened yet. But we can certainly take a, a give you an update offline if that's OK. Andrew, do you have any? Yeah, uh, apologies, the, the, the Chair and I were just wanting to confirm what, what page you were on, kind of on the document, so, so we're on there. Um, this bit here on the page 40 is the report itself. Yes, there's, a lack there's of also a, yeah. trying to find okay. it in, in, in the document. So, so yeah, th this, is, this is around sort of ed education piece around what is a project, what is a programme, what is a portfolio, uh, when you kind of complete a business case, which we do think needs some further kind of clarification. So that is covered in the, in the, in the programme work. But what we are doing at the moment is reissuing. We already have like a project management framework and guide. So we're going to be reissuing that to, to assist people with that. And actually there's some training on next next week is it or the next couple of weeks also a refresher around program management kind of training as well so that will cover it as well so so yes there are steps being made but there is part of a big program of work around education around project and program management thank you thank you thanks richard and thanks angie uh david thank you chair um I'm interested about uh, CR19, Change and Transformation Control 2, on page 55. Um, reading the findings and implications of this, it does read as if business cases have been signed off without the full gamut of information uh, being available to the people making that decision process. Can we expand on that, please, and find out what's actually happened there, please? Andy, do you want me to go first? Yeah, if you, if you go first, okay. just to explain what your audit is. Yeah. Yeah, so I think um, from our findings, um, there were a few business cases where there might have been some sections missing on the, the actual form itself. And then in the meeting minutes, we could see that something they'd be, it had been appro approved and discussed, but there were still further actions needed. But then we couldn't necessarily see that coming back for the, the, the extra information coming back. So that's why we've put the action in place to make sure that there's a robust review from the finance team before it goes to SLT. The form is going to be updated to make it clear that there's... I think what we, we were seeing almost um, a bit of a kind of narrow view of, of it, of business cases, rather than the team that were requesting 
the approval of the business case, looking wider and thinking, okay, do we need IT support here? Will we need L and D support here to implement this? And actually, that has wider kind of capacity and financial implications, and that wasn't necessarily being taken into consideration at the scoping point. So it's about the education that Andy talked about. It's in, about improving the form so that um, it guides staff to how much detail is needed, and then you've got that extra review of finance before it comes to SLT. So that's um, that's what, what we've put in place to address our findings. I don't know if Angie wants to add a bit more detail from her point of view. Yeah, I think there was there was two things that were mainly we discussed out of the audit. One was that um, at times business cases are approved because there's an urgent business need to do so, subject to particular things that have been discussed verbally being included in the paperwork. And what we didn't have was then the flow of the paperwork to confirm that the amended business case was the one that was on record. So mm -hmm. that that's something that that. Um, that, that's part of what we were working on. The other one is the one that were, um, Vicky was saying where there was a, you know, our, our learning from some business cases was that it was too narrow in some areas. So, for example, because it hadn't gone to fleet first, there hadn't been consideration that the new post would require sort of a pool car. So then you can't, those are the kind of things that have been identified and as we've been learning as we've been going along um, and are now sort of being then through this advisory audit, we will update and refresh the business case template to make sure those are things that are included going forward. And we now have a checklist on the front to confirm that it's gone to all of the relevant departments and all of those things are captured. So I think those are the two aspects in terms of the, the business case kind of audit and the work that's going on around that. And the business cases that have been identified in this document in March, April and May, are they going to get revisited and checked? So I'm just refreshing myself on which ones those are. I don't think we actually put the the, the detail of the business cases in there, um, but we can we can share that with Angie from our sample testing. Yeah, I think. Um, so it was a reference of February. So uh, in terms of the March ones, those ones have been revisited because we've been revisiting in phase in terms of the implications of implementation around that, and that's linked to the risk management. Um, audit that we also did as well and and also and, and the other two are around making sure that the extra information which was discussed verbally is then included in the paperwork so what we're doing through our enhanced tracking is making sure that we've got the final version of those business cases great that sounds very thorough thank you thank you david do we have any other questions on this no okay So the committee is asked to consider the internal audit progress report for 22-23 to date and to consider the internal audit report, the findings and agreed management actions for the following audit, which is the business cases and benefits realisation, uh, Appendix 2. So I think we've done that. We can move on to agenda item 10, which is the update on internal audit recommendations. And I think it's Caroline again. Yes, it is. <coughs> Excuse me. Right, thank you. So this report is for noting. If I can ask members to turn to page 76, appendix 1. The summary table gives you information on the progress against the 2020-21 internal audit plan where we had 36 actions that were identified as a result of the 2021 internal audit plan. 27 are now complete, 4 actions have been superseded, 5 are on track but not yet due for completion. We also have an update on the 21-22 internal audit plan. In total there are 51 actions. 39 have been completed and two actions have been superseded and nine actions are on track and two have requested an extension that was approved by the SLT at the September meeting. Finally, the last table under Appendix 1 provides an update on agreed actions um, from the 22-23 audit plan, so specifically the protection audit. As you will see, there are two actions agreed for the protection audit, of which one has already been completed and one is on track. 
The business cases and benefit realisation audit was finalised too late for inclusion in this table this time round, but be included in the next AJEC update. But members have just been given a copy of this audit and an update um, today from Vicky. On page 77, appendix 2, this section of the report gives you a summary of progress against those actions for 2021 which are still open. Likewise, page 81, appendix 3, gives you a summary of progress against those actions for 21-22 and identifies the fleet action where extensions have been approved by SLT and an action has been superseded. So from since the last AJEC meeting in September, from the 2021 audit plan, two DICE actions have been completed, uh, meaning that all outstanding actions from that DICE audit have now been resolved. Uh, the two DICE actions that were completed was the Yes You Can website has been updated to include work completed to date um, on the implement implementation of the DICE strategy and the cultural change programme and the services commitment to a diverse, inclusive and cohesive and equal working environment will also be detailed. We've also had an equal opportunities monitoring information form updated to enhance monitoring and reporting of workforce DICE data. So the, that, that DICE audit is now, now complete in terms of actions. From the 21-22 audit, uh, since the last AJEC meeting in September, we've had one fleet action completed, um, which is aligning the fleet and vehicle replacement expenditure with the capital expenditure plans and reporting. Uh, one, fleet, one of the fleet actions has been superseded as the draft inspection policy is now encompassed by the new fleet policy in action, um, fleet action number two. And three financial control audits have also been completed, all relating to the rollout of the devolved budgets across the service. So all the actions relating to this audit have now also been resolved. So that's my update um, in terms of this report. So unless members have any further questions, as stated earlier, this report is for noting. Thank you. <coughs> Sorry, I'm losing my voice uh, gradually during, during the meeting. Um, it, it's um, the, the report only has one extension, the fleet management. Everything else is completed and superseded. So, um, well done on that. And I'd just like to invite questions. Neil. No red. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions for or statements? No. Richard. Just just quickly, Chair, in terms of the, uh, I know we've been looking at trying to uh, devolve budgets for probably about 18 months or so ago now, and uh, in terms of the journey, uh, any kind of overall feedback that you can give on that? I know it was a, 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 a good way to, to move and the authority were, were certainly behind that. I was just interested in terms of the, the hitches along the way, really. It's not, it's not, not an easy thing to do, is it, from, <laughs> from centralised budget start? It's not, it's not my area, so Angie might come in in a minute, but um, from our perspective, obviously all the audit actions have been closed and uh, as a member of SLT, we've very much been having a lot of training in terms of um, getting this now rolled out, ready for us moving to the next financial year. So I, I'm new into the organisation and it's, it's been very pleasing to see how we're moving in terms of um, that transition to devolved budgets and to date, I personally haven't come across any hiccups. <laughs> pass you over to Angie. Not, not much to add to that, Caroline. Kind of, uh, uh, it, it's been a sort of shadow year for us where we've been setting up all of the systems and processes mm -hmm. and training and access to the devolved budget kind of information uh, for us to go live with devolve for pay and non-pay from uh, the next financial year. It always makes sense to launch it from the beginning of a financial year. Um, but yeah, the feedback we received it, it's going well, it's very welcomed, and the training, which has been both generic and also specific to individual needs, um, has been helpful as well, as has the introduction of the business partner model in finance. So finance are now working uh, much kind of closely with managers about their budgets, etc. So, so of course, we, we wait and see with a kind of launch, but I'm confident we've got all the things in, in place and the feedback so far has been good from our staff. Okay. Any other questions? No? Well, <clears throat> thanks to all in the team uh, for their work on this. The recommendations are that we note the progress made against the internal audit recommendations. Chair, I think Vicky would like
So, apologies, Vicky. <laughs> Sorry, I um, didn't see you there. There was um, there were two comments I wanted to make on different topics. On the devolved budgets, we've just completed our financial controls audit, which looked at purchase, purchase to pay. So that would have been that's looked at some of the devolved budgets. So that will come to the next meeting, and that's looking at the control, the new um, design of the control framework to ensure that when procurement and purchasing is occurring, that you've got that um, devolved budget um, process set up. Uh, framework set up and then secondly just to um, give an update on the, the slight changes that we've done to the follow-up so in the past um, you'd get updates from Caroline and then we'd look at it annually and sometimes we'd have to reopen an action but we we're now looking at it um, kind of checking in through before a JEC meeting so we have validated already the reports and the closures that are reported to you so hopefully we then won't get that reopening of actions if we don't feel they've been implemented so that's an improvement that we've put in place as well this time that's good to hear thanks sorry i wasn't expecting questions from that side <laughs> um okay so we're asked to note the progress made against the internal order recommendations and management actions and i think we can do that okay so moving on to agenda item 11, which is the date of the next meeting, which will be the Wednesday, the 22nd of March 2023 at 10.30 hours. And that will be in the main conference room at headquarters. Do we need to move that one, Amanda? No. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, moving on to agenda item 12. We now go to the exclusion of the press and the public. So I'd like to resolve that the public be excluded from the meeting during the following items of business on the grounds that they contain exempt information pursuant to Schedule 12A, Part 1 of the Local Government Act. So I will propose that we do that. Can I have a seconder for that, please? Can you just carry on the rest of the wording over the page? Oh. Absolutely. Sorry. I have a brain fog today. You'll have to excuse me. I'll start again. To resolve that the public be excluded from the meeting during the following items of business on the grounds that they contain exempt information pursuant to Schedule 12A, Part 1 of the Local Government Act 1972, and that in accordance with Schedule 12A, Part 2, Paragraph 10 of the Local Government Act 1972, the public interest in maintaining the exemption outweighs the public interest in disclosing the information. So I will propose at this point that we exclude the press and the public. May I have a seconder? Thank you, John. And I will ask for any votes against, any abstentions, and all votes in favour. Okay, we will now... Um, if you could stop the recording... <laughs>